We're going to go right into our next session. Uh, it's from one of our favorites at SVG, Mr. Chris Whitmire. He is a member of the Sports Content Management Committee, a uh, longtime member, and you're going to hear about a deal that was just officially announced not too long ago between AWS and NASCAR. Um, Chris is going to give you a little insight into some of the decisions they made and some of the cool workflows they're going to be working on. So if you can take your seat, head any conversations out into the hall, I'll give it away to Mr. Chris Whitmire. Chris? You're too kind. Uh, clickers up here, right? How many people have been dealing with metadata? Using AI out there to, do, to solve your problems? Wow. No one is using AI to solve your problems right now. John? Interns. Interns. Okay, we do have interns. Um, so we're going to walk you through a bit of a case study of what we've been doing over the last two years. You heard a little bit earlier today. Um, and yes, it's official uh, as of about, I guess... 45 days ago, we signed up with Amazon to do this. But we're going to talk about how we do everything with AI. Uh, Chris Whitmire, Director of Broadcast Production, New Media Technology for NASCAR. Uh, as you see, we have a lot of different uh, cars up there. We actually have motorcycles as well, AMA Pro, Flat Track, and IMSA. Uh, not a very good picture of them, but it's Porsche, Lamborghini, Ferrari, Jaguar, Audi. I'm missing a couple in there somewhere. But we are um, the largest uh, broadcaster of, uh, of uh, motorsports. Um, no one's argued that, so I'm going to keep saying it. We have a couple of use cases here. Uh, we talked about a few of them earlier. Predictive analysis, not really interesting, not for me at least. Video image and metadata tagging, that's kind of cool. No more interns. Uh, speech to text and language translation. We have 500,000 hours of content. That's a lot. Uh, if you're looking at the bottom and you can read the fine print, it's more like 768,000 hours if you include the audio, but mm, no one cares about audio. Ah, that's 15 petabytes of data. Growth rate of 1.2 petabytes per year. That's a lot of data. And that's all going to go to the cloud. But the problem we have, as you can see, is with 3 million video assets, 10 million metadata points, and the 12 years it took us to log all this, that's 3 metadata tags per asset. That's not very good. What that tells me is that we have assets in there that actually haven't even had a barcode put to them correctly. Um, so this is really bad. So what are the facts about the humans? Well, in 80,000 hours of basically logged footage, uh, uh, of, of the 500,000, we've only done 80,000 hours of it. The best employee can log two hours of footage in a day. That means the human is 25% efficient. It's a really bad investment. For those that are familiar, the gas engine is 23.5%, and that's been around for a long time, too. So cars and humans are both equally inefficient. It'll take us 156 years to complete that logging. And that's to add the metadata we really want in there, right? What's the value of a clip if you don't have any metadata on it? So we said, what about artificial intelligence? We read the buzzword, we checked it out, and it turns out that there's a great quote you can find by John McCarthy. Artificial intelligence involves machines that can perform tasks that are characteristic of human intelligence. All right? It's well beyond us. But what does it really mean? There's three types of artificial intelligence out there. Uh, you have super intelligence. If you read Nick Bostrom's book, it's not really that good, but you could read it and you could find out that eventually we're going to get to this point where the machines take over. It's going to be a while from now. Next is general intelligence. Again, pretty deep stuff. And what we're in is this little thing called narrow intelligence. You have your Alexa at home, does all these cool things, can tell you where your package is at. That's narrow intelligence. iPhoto can identify who's in the pictures. And in our case, we built a model to do that. So. The subset of artificial intelligence is machine learning. Again, quote, uh, Arthur Samuel states that machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Now we're making sense. We know what this means. Find me a car with a number 43 on it. That seems like a pretty good, a good question. Now, I did this once before. Who drives the number 43? We have a few fans in the back. I appreciate that. Free tickets, whoever said that. Uh, it is Richard Petty. Actually, it's now Bubba Wallace. Um, Richard Petty retired a little while ago, um, but there's his iconic car right there, the 43. Okay, so now we, we asked it a question, what does it do? We got to go to the neural network. This is some crazy stuff. So, in 1968, sorry, 1962, uh, Hubble and Wiesel did a really cool experiment. If you ever want to look it up, there's actually a YouTube video. It's really hard to follow, though. But essentially, they put some diodes on a cat's brain and... Uh, they tried to figure out what it was looking for, like what it was seeing. 
And what we learned is that the way we view things isn't the way we think we view things. We view lines, right? We don't actually see pictures. When I look at you guys, my brain has processed all these things. Some have more lines for their hair than other. Just pointing that out. The point being is that <laughs> the neurons only fire when things go past our field of view. Now, there's like 100 billion neurons in our noggins. There's about, I don't know, a couple hundred million that work for your eyes, your visual cortex, the front part. That's why we have the big foreheads. But what they found out is that little line right there, you could barely see it, but if you go on YouTube, you can. What they found was that the cat's neurons lit up when that line crossed by, and they realized that it only saw lines. It builds the image. We can work with this. So a little more research led us to the Deep Learning and Neural Networks and ImageNet Project. So I think it was Stanford, I could be wrong, but this challenge they do every year, uh, since 2010, Fei-Fei Li, a whole bunch of really smart people are trying to figure out how to make, uh, how to identify uh, particular images, right? I mentioned trees and cactuses and things like that, not useful for NASCAR. But the point being is what they do is they say, we're gonna get a bunch of images together, we're gonna make this open source sort of library, if you will, and we're gonna try and figure out how we can understand what's inside of there. Didn't work so well in the beginning, as you could see, it was like 28% uh, accuracy rating, and you'll note the human is around 5%. So in 2015, 17, the, uh, the actual um, uh, error classification and the ability to see things from a computer's point of view finally is better than a human. That's pretty cool. We're on the right track. So what do we want to do with it? Well, we're all about open source. So here's our key criteria. Open source, portable. We're with Amazon today. We actually weren't with Amazon when we started this project. We didn't know where we were going to go. So we didn't want to do a bunch of work and be stuck with somebody. So now we have this portable product. We wanted a common support language. Python, Go, Ruby, things that people know. Things that they can support, not .NET. Sorry, my friends out there who program in .NET. And we want it to be scalable. Once we build this thing, we want to grow and shrink and do whatever it needs to do so that we can be successful. So, again, we hit the internet. We did a lot of searching over the last two years. And we found, as you can see from this really cool chart, that the number one um, framework that people were using was TensorFlow. Okay? So we used that. And in fact, uh, this was uh, the last published date of this was around 2018 and 2019. Keros comes into there. And so people can use Keros as a framework that sits on top of TensorFlow or other frameworks. So we're sort of dabbling with that now. But what it means is you can go online, you can download this, and you can make your own models. And here's again our key criteria. So TensorFlow supports Python, C, uh, C++, Go, and Java. Python seems like a good answer for us. But take note that the execution system of, t of TensorFlow sits on Google Cloud, Amazon, Microsoft, you could do it on your local computer, and frankly, you could do it on an Android device, and they have some really cool apps out there where you can identify plants. They're using TensorFlow. You ever go into the App Store and look for it? That's what's happening. So, hardware. Well, we first did our demonstration in the office on a Mac Mini. It worked pretty well. Not terribly efficient, but worked well. So we looked at it, we said, okay, CPU, GPU, and TPU. Well, a CPU, of course, is low latency and low throughput. Okay, cool. GPU, higher latency, higher throughput, and this thing called a TPU. This thing is designed for ML stuff. It was well beyond us. It was expensive. It was fast. It was cool. Moving past it. So how do we actually do this whole thing, right? We told you what we wanted to do. Now we're going to show you. So it's this five-step, four-step process. Sorry, five-step process here. We're going to define the data. Who's the number 43? The less people know it's Richard Petty than before. <laughs> Oh, have I put you to sleep? All right. It is indeed Richard Petty. We took thousands of images of Richard Petty, and occasionally one where he wrecked his car, because that happens. And we had to get all these different images because we need to have not just a front view, but a side view, a skewed view, right? When you see people, you don't ever just see them straight on. You see them from the side, but you still recognize them. We had to, te we had to teach that model what it looks like. We've got to train this thing. So, two things, supervised and unsupervised. In the unsupervised model, you take a lot more images. You'll take note, we have a, what appears to be a VW bug of some sort or a Mini Cooper, I don't know. We've got some trees. The problem is, is that when you do that, 
you've been taught to understand what a tree is and what a Mini Cooper looking thing is. But the answer is, is that that takes a lot more images. You had to be trained as a human, right? So what if we just simply highlighted all the number 43s and said, just look for these. That's all we really care about. And that's what we did. We actually broke it down into um, a couple of things to build our model. We said, we want to have key personalities, right? Richard Petty, that might be one of them. We want the car number, we want the sponsor logo, but we don't know what we might want next. So what we did is we found this app. You guys can go online too. There's a little link at the bottom. You can go use this. There's a couple others out there as well. And it allows you to take an image, put it in here, and write a little box around it and say, what is it? In this case, we're looking at STP and we're looking at the 43. We weren't quite looking at Richard's face just yet. It's quite the mop he's got going on, so we avoided that. And we said, add a bounding box and add a label. We did that a lot of times. We take them all and we go to a pre-trained model. Now what's really cool about a pre-trained model is someone did the work for you. They've gone through and they've taken, again, with ImageNet, and there's a link later on here, I believe. They've taken ImageNet and they've said, hey, we've looked at hundreds of thousands of images. We know what lines look like. Remember the cat? Well, those lines kind of look like a 43 sometimes, but I told it what it was. In fact, one of the crazy parts is when you think about it, when you were a kid, someone told you what a dog was. My favorite analogies. But dogs had floppy ears. Then you met a dog with pointy ears. You had to train it, right? You had to learn the differences in dogs. We're doing the same thing here with all these items. So then we test that model. Turns out it works pretty well. But we learned some new things. Someone on the internet decided to take Jimmy Johnson's beard, he's a NASCAR driver for those that don't follow, and put it on another guy named Brad Keselowski. And you'll take note that they look pretty similar. And so the machine would have failed because it was looking for things. Now the interesting thing about what it's looking for is you don't know. There are smarter people out there that will explain it to you someday. The point being is that we know where eyeballs are at. The computer doesn't know what an eyeball is. It simply says that these dots have different shadows and shade effects to them. It's all grayscale. And in this particular case, it clearly had been looking at the beard. Okay, well that's a problem for us. So we had to start training it to look at people with and without beards. And what you end up with is a false positive, something where it says, oh, this is correct. Uh, a false negative where it says, uh, it identifies something incorrect, right? So what we have to do is retrain our model. We had to deploy the model. In this particular case, I'm probably going to go well over on this one, but it's fun. In this particular case, we looked at local, cloud, and uh, IaaS, and PaaS, right? Do we want to use another service? Do we want to use uh, our local machines? And again, we found out what the financial investments were, and the cloud actually turns out to be pretty good if you want to do it at large scale. So what did we find out? Turns out that image detection actually worked. We could identify car numbers with a high percentage point, 97, sponsor logos 96, and personalities 95, roughly speaking. It wasn't always that perfect. We also found out that the machine is more efficient than the human. You'll take note that it identified two hours of content in 51 minutes. It took our human eight hours to do that. So the Mac Mini is more efficient than the human. Not a good statement to stay. So what did we find? Visual skewing. Um, it did cause some problems. Um, if it was too skewed, we have the brain processing power to figure that out. Machines don't always have that. We needed more skew. We need to find a physical relationship. So when a driver puts a helmet on, his face is gone. We don't know who he is. If we've tracked him with his helmet on and he takes it off, he's now headless. We'll track the actual helmet. So it became a problem for us. And also, this is where the cloud comes in to be really cool, is we didn't know how to do emotions and actions, right? I can tell when a human is upset or some perhaps asleep in this presentation because I've learned what it looks like. But our computer model doesn't know that. And some of the cloud providers have figured these things out. So that's pretty cool. And we also learned that we detected way too many frames and created a ton of metadata. So we had to fix that. So we also talked about number two, which was our transcription and translation. This actually ended up being a really easy project. It's kind of fun. You should go home and try it yourselves. We wanted to say, OK, well, our, we're an international brand. And we need to make sure we have closed captions on there. So what we've done is we, we've actually sent the video through um, AWS and the Transcribe and Translate service and generated six different languages. Anybody can translate that one? hat ich mein Chance. Do we have a German over here? Can I get a cup of coffee? No, no, not even close. Finally, I have my 
There you go. Finally, he has his shot. So, guys like diagrams. Here's what it looks like. Transcription and translation. We take those... Uh, 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 meta, uh, we take the, uh, the MOV files, the MP4 files in this particular case, we upload it to storage. We then run transcode on top of it. We make that nice HLS file. Maybe someday we'll get to that CMAF thing, the mystery that is. We then put it into a different S3 bucket. We then run machine learning against, or transcribe and translate against that one file format, right? The smaller one. Why? We want to save money. We then spit it back out as a JSON document or a VTT file. In fact, we do both. And then from CloudFront in our little video player, we're able to link the actual video itself, the HLS, and the VTT files, and we have closed captioning in multiple languages, as you saw earlier. So overall workflow, here you go. I had to make it real simple and real big. What we're doing is we're taking content, we're putting it into buckets in the cloud, we run the business. In this case, the business is scene detection, right? Helps us reduce the amount of metadata points, speech to text, and of course, our NASCAR models. Any questions? Sorry for going along. Oh, wait, Nick Gold with a question. It's so unlikely that you would ask. What, what problem are you solving today? Ooh. Okay. Uh, what, what, uh, what problem are we solving with machine learning? Humans are highly inefficient. Um, as we look to become better at our jobs, we want to be able to log all the metadata. By logging that metadata, we can find the content. By finding the content, we can sell the content. Or, as we should say more appropriately, we can give it to the fans so they can enjoy that content. That is our number one thing we're solving. Now, you're going to say, aren't you displacing people? And the answer is yes. But I would challenge you to say, has anybody ever gotten out of college with a really expensive degree and said, I want to look at 1940s footage and identify people I've never heard of before eight hours a day? The answer is no. So what we're doing is we're giving them the opportunity to learn the content in a QC model. And this is what you're going to see over the coming months is that as we're deploying all of this, they're no longer, because we actually QC right now, so we do two steps. We identify and we QC. What we're doing next is we're going to rip through the content and they can QC and then we have access to it. So that's really the big problem we're solving. Yes? Were you able to, with AI, with AWS, go back and do more than three metadata tags per asset? You might have explained it, but... Yeah, yeah. So we were able to do a heck of a lot more. Um, we ended up blowing through something like 400,000 frames. The old legacy stuff. We are currently getting ready to roll that out. If you think about it, that model only has a handful of things in it. Um, we've identified Richard Petty. We've identified the number 43. We have to go through and get all the key personalities. We're looking at about 110 to 120 different faces we have to do some image detection on. So it takes a little more time. Uh, we anticipate rolling this out in October to December, somewhere in there, giving ourselves a nice leeway. Like a people-less algorithm that AI would do and just create work where you may want the metadata to detect. Not sure I follow. The machine is doing what? creating to an algorithm where the new metadata, the missing or additional metadata... Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. No, that's exactly what we're doing. Yes, we are using the model it's running and it figures out where things are at and adds the metadata. Yes. Are you doing everything in open source? Outside of transcribe and translate, yes. These models are ours. We will take them and go wherever we want. We will build them here. We're going to use them in AWS. Uh, we have a great partnership there, and so I suspect we'll be staying there for quite some time. But we wanted to make sure that we could move it around if we needed to. Grant. How did you decide when to actually start feeding all of your frames through this model? So, in other words, was there a point where you said, well, we're not going to get this model to the next step uh, before we want to start enjoying the benefits of this step? And because I guess I'm trying to, to gauge... Accuracy ratings? No. How many times do you think you're going to actually... Ah. Change the model and then refeed all the content. Yeah, the question is, is uh, when do we figure out that we are good and what are we going to do when it keeps on running and isn't so good anymore? It's a good question. And the answer to that is retraining of the model. Um, it, we'll say 1,000 pictures we started with, and then we went back to 2,000 pictures, and then as it continues to change, right? As some of us have more hair today, I may not have this much hair tomorrow, so I might have to start retraining the algorithm on different faces. It's really neat how it all works out. I get it? But also, how do you manage the expense of running the same frames through the model more than once? You don't have to retrain on the already identified items. Well, I know that, but oh. you're, run you're running the same frames through a model again, and each time you do that, obviously, there's an AWS expense associated with it, and so I'm kind of saying, you know, when... Grant, stop being a naysayer. <laughs> when does the next iteration become good? 
good enough to justify the expense of that. When the, when the model actually starts to lose its accuracy rating, anything above 89, 90 something percent, uh, it actually uh, it needs to be retrained. Anything below that number, uh, you should expect high enough numbers like that. Again, as we saw, the human is sometimes inaccurate. So we look at a percentage of rating, and I suspect we'll be discussing this more and more as we continue to evolve. And I think I'm being given the crux. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.